Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you by Coca-Cola, supporting Native news across the North. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. By the generous support of the Alaska Native Health Board. Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you native news across the north. I'd like to welcome our viewers in Juneau over KJUD TV Channel 8. Heartbeat Alaska is aired every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. there. And I'm pleased to announce that with the addition of KJUD, we are now aired in every village and city in Alaska. More news. Canada has switched from one time across the nation to three times a week over five time zones. Thank you very much, Television Northern Canada and Northern Native Broadcasting in Whitehorse. When we say we bring you Native news across the North, we mean across the North. <laughs> On today's program, we visit Sitka thanks to a delightful production from North Star Television Network and Dan Etulane. We learn about the Native culture in Sitka through the findings of a centuries-old medicine man, so stay tuned for that. But first, here is Native News Across the Americas with Gary Fife and National Native News. This is National Native News. I'm Gary Fife. Three more Alaska Native villages have been granted rights to special subsistence salmon fisheries by a state judge. The ruling in favor of the villages of Ninilchik, Nick, and Eklutna follows a precedent set by the Knightsi tribe, which has established a federal subsistence right and conducts an annual net fishery in the Kenai River. No word on when those subsistence proposals would go before the state fish board. House and Senate committees in Washington that oversee native issues are considering bills that would give tribes more, more say over management of fish and wildlife, as well as farming and grazing lands. Last week, the Senate Indian Affairs Committee held hearings on draft legislation that would give tribes more regulatory authority over fish and game on their lands and help them tap into conservation funds they can't use now. Many tribes say they need more regulatory authority because of the basic subsistence and spiritual importance fish and wildlife have in their way of life. On the House side, the Native American Affairs Subcommittee is considering legislation to enhance tribal farming and the management of agricultural lands. Subcommittee Chairman Bill Richardson said the bill was aimed at helping tribes get a better economic return from their land. He said the Bureau of Indian Affairs and other federal agencies have dropped the ball Tribes say they support the concept, but they add any legislation should leave most of the management decisions to them, not the federal agencies who have contributed to the problem. The Wisconsin Menominee woman who's been nominated to the post of Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Interior Department has begun making her rounds of visits to Capitol Hill. But as of the 22nd, there was still no date for her confirmation hearings before the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. Ada Deer has paid courtesy calls on a few committee members and will meet with others in coming weeks. But the committee is unable to set a hearing date on her confirmation because the Federal Bureau of Investigation is still conducting a background check. It's uncertain how long that will take to complete. Natives in Southern California gathered in Los Angeles last week as part of a campaign to stop smoking or other tobacco abuse. Of particular interest is an effort to stop native children from using chewing tobacco or snuff. Conference attendees were shown methods of traditional usage of the plant and the spiritual place it held in native societies. Workshops also covered the dangers of mouth cancers and other health risks associated with the practices of chewing tobacco. And finally, Friday, Friday, June the 25th marked the 117th anniversary of the Battle of the Little Bighorn where Plains tribes defeated Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and the U.S. 7th Cavalry. 
for those interested in the controversial soldier in mid-June in Bismarck, North Dakota. There was a Custer look-alike and an actual descendant who attended the 20th anniversary convention of the Little Bighorn Associates. This is National Native News, and for Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife. Thanks, Gary. Stay tuned for news from Southeast Alaska right after these messages. Rain has never stopped us from doing anything. We are prepared. Most of the downtown sidewalks are covered. If you have news or information from your village or community, please call Heartbeat Alaska, area code 907-563-3507, or fax 907-563-7079. Fire can turn any room in your house into a death trap. Make sure your family knows two ways out of every room. Plan ahead for fire. This message was brought to you by the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Corporation as part of the National Community Volunteer Fire Safety Project. Akkasharachchit <laughs> North Star Productions in Sitka presents a history of Russian and Clinket contact. Of course, history did not begin only with Russian contact to that part of Alaska. For thousands of years, the Clinkets used the area just north of Sitka as a summer and winter camp. That site was known as She. She Attica, the people of She. For centuries, Sitka was a Clinket Indian village. In 1799, a large Russian trading company established a settlement at a site a few miles north of the village and called it Redoubt St. Michael. This Russian outpost was to be the center of the profitable fur trade along the Pacific Northwest coast. The Russians did not get along well with the Clinket. In 1802, the Indians destroyed Redoubt St. Michael and most of its inhabitants. The Russians returned in 1804 with several hundred men and several ships. The Indians took position in a strategically placed log and earthen fort designed to resist the cannon fire from the ships. Even though this was a new type of warfare for them, the Sitka Clinket were well prepared. Under the leadership of Catlian of the Kiksani clan and of the other clan leaders, they successfully resisted the Russian assaults. But by the seventh night, the Sitkins had run out of ammunition, and they had to abandon the fort under cover of darkness. They moved overland to the north side of the island and did not return for several years. The Russians claimed the best of the old Clinket village site and built warehouses, bunkhouses, and a stockade around the new town, which they called New Archangel. They also built a mansion on the site of the Kiksadi clan houses on the bluff above the new town. This mansion became known as Baranoff Castle. After a number of years, the Clinket returned to resume the trade interrupted by the conflict with the Russians. They occupied what is now called the Indian village outside the stockade. New Archangel, or Sitka as people went on calling it, became the capital of Russian America, and for a long time it was the only city on the west coast of North America. It had schools, a seminary, a hospital, an observatory, boat building yards, and sawmills, and a glittering social life. It also had a remarkable Russian Orthodox cathedral. In those days, San Francisco was a tiny frontier settlement, and Los Angeles a sleepy Mexican mission village. But by 1865, there were too few sea otter left to hunt. The other Russian ventures in America did not fare too well, and the Russian government 
got tired of subsidizing a money-losing operation so far away. The Russian Empire sold Alaska to the United States for $7,200,000. Not a bad deal, considering how little of it it actually owned. In 1867, the Russian double eagle was lowered and replaced with the Stars and Stripes on Castle Hill in Sitka. Most of the Russians returned to Russia. A relatively quiet time followed. Baranov Castle, the governor's mansion, was abandoned. It burned down in 1894, and another building erected in its place was eventually torn down. Sitka remained the capital of Alaska until the title went to the gold mining town of Juneau in 1912. In 1912 also, the Alaska Native Brotherhood was founded in Sitka to work for justice and dignity for the American Indian. It is now the oldest continuing Indian organization in North America. Clinkett had always relied on fishing, but in the 1920s, commercial fishing became important in Sitka and canneries were built. During World War II, Sitka was the site of major military installations. Japonski Island and the surrounding islands were heavily fortified. Near where the stockade stood, separating the Russian city from the Indian village, the replica of a blockhouse stands guard. In the Russian cemetery nearby, old graves slowly return to the forest. But where else can you have a bald eagle perching in your backyard? Whales off the front yard. Baby salmon in the streams, who when they grow up will return from the sea by the thousands to spawn in their native creeks. And the lush rainforest at the end of the street. The Sitka rose, the Sitka black-tailed deer, and the majestic Sitka spruce were named for Sitka. Sitka, as the rest of southeast Alaska, is famous for its moderate but damp climate. Except that we don't call this rain. We call it liquid sunshine, or sometimes southeastern sunshine. Rain has never stopped us from doing anything. We are prepared. Most of the downtown sidewalks are covered. And even though you won't see too many umbrellas, we usually have waterproof clothing within easy reach. We hate to admit it, but we also get plenty of the dry sunshine here in Sitka. Sitka is truly one of the most beautiful cities in the world. However, as time marches by, it brings with it change. Oh, Sitka is still beautiful. I remember as a child walking down by the Indian village. In front of one of the houses was a stone bear. I discovered that it used to mark a grave site. It's not there anymore. It's been removed to protect it from artifact seekers. Recently, a centuries-old grave was discovered. And the Clinkett Indians are making steps to ensure that this grave is protected. Yeah, that's... <laughs> on May 31st, 10-year-old Kaylee Eliason, out on a church picnic, thought she was digging up a coconut. It turned out to be a skull protruding above the ground. Halibut Point Recreation Area is a popular picnic spot in Sitka. Years ago, though, it was the site of a burial ground for the Clinkett Indians who inhabited that area of Sitka. According to Dave McMahon, state archaeologist and forensic anthropologist, the remains of a 30 to 40 year old Indian male was unearthed. In an elders meeting last Thursday, more than just bones was revealed. 
The state experts estimate that the remains are between 100 and 200 years old. This is based on counting the tree rings on the spruce trees that have grown over the site where the bones were found. However, based on oral tradition and the strong knowledge of family history, the Clinkets themselves have filled in the blanks. You won't find any traces of those things, but he was a medicine man. According to Herman Kitka Sr., a Cogwanton of the Brown Bear Clan down in southeast Alaska, the remains were that of a medicine man who at the time of his death was training to be a leader of all the Cogwanton clan in the northern area of southeast Alaska. The buried man was of the Wolf clan. He died from pneumonia. He was also part of the Cogwanton. And medicine man. But that medicine man said, you called on me too late. It's beyond where I can save you. The man appeared to have been buried in a sitting position, which is significant to some Indians down in southeast Alaska who say that shamans used to be buried in that position. The elders will ultimately determine the Indian's history. In any case, he was thought to be a leader. The elders of today are following that lead by choosing to honor these remains, a privilege that was once impossible. Gray family, our Gray and Walter Gray. Their grandmother was buried on the first, the first parking lot. Yes, you come in from town, and there's a road goes down, there, down toward that island. That picnic table is now moved up, and grass is grown over. I looked at it yesterday. They put a slab over that grave, and been there for many years. And when it became a park, they shoved that concrete into the brush. And Walter, uh, Howard Cree showed me for about 75 feet from the original site. They lined up the island with the uh, point of further island, and it's right here. His grandmother was buried in an Indian bent wood box. They called it Yai Akatu. It was square, and in them days you had to hold the body up and sit them upright with their arms like that. And that's the reason most of them are buried out there. We decided to keep this a secret because at that time our grave sites had been vandalized and headstones are stolen and now appearing in Europe, especially those with Indian names on it. Fighting to preserve their rich culture through honoring burial sites is nothing new to the Sitka Indians. I quit drinking about 12 years ago and started getting more active in the Native community. Younger people that used to drink and use drugs and vandalize this place today come in and offer to help me do some clearing in here. A few years ago, Bob Sam was inspired to undertake clearing an historical graveyard in Sitka. Throughout the area, however, many ancient graves are not marked, especially near Halibut Point, where the earlier Coho Indians settled, and where earlier this century many victims of the smallpox epidemic were laid to rest. Albert Davis's grandmother was one of these. His mother never knew where her mother was buried. Government regulations at that time forbade this information due to the fear of the spreading of the illness. My mother said, I think there's a lot of more people there from uh, It was an influenza epidemic. The authorities wouldn't even let my, my mother visit the grave. As soon as that... Uh, the grapes that appeared to be deteriorating or abandoned, developers still houses on them with options to buy. I know that this kind of a thing is not going to happen, and that's not going to be treated with more respect, and we appreciate it. Halibut Point Recreation Area, a popular gathering place for Sitka residents, has taken on a new significance.
a reminder of Clinkett history that refuses to be forgotten. Through disease, battles, and modern Western influence, the Clinkett people hold fast to their own ways. The medicine man will be returned to his resting place, facing the channel, doing what he was trained to do centuries ago, looking out for his people. The elders meet again next Thursday with Jack Blackwell from Alaska Parks and also with Sitka Tribe to determine the best way to protect the remains and also to plan a reburial ceremony. I'd like to thank Sitka Tribes of Alaska for their help in this story, in particular Terry Pegues, also Dan Edelaine and the Sitka Sentinel. Most importantly though, I'd like to thank the elders for allowing us to film their meeting. Find out how some Anchorage natives get their native food right after these messages. We have always felt in harmony with the land. Chakome, Tapua, the Skumuk, the Tapiachu, Kenok Anesche, Matapua, Makaspumos, Akum. Help the Soil Conservation Service help our Earth. Call us today. We owe it to our children. Utok kalininga inyum kuya naktuk rawalo aktok. Utok kanabot aw lagaktut kaw nagininat si kaganak singman. Ikayutik sa niktut utok kaliwat ay mirala sibluwit. Ilisi magovit inyum mikpilguy liramik ikayok si kaktuk rawamik koko rawaluwit mingwaktokovit utok kanakarvik timim iluwag niksang ngun sa waktit. Naka Kokola Luta, 800-770-0138. One, do you know the difference between HIV and AIDS? Two, how safe. The virus does not discriminate. For those lucky people that go to fish camp, they probably have fish year-round. But for some of us in Anchorage, we have to stock up in other ways. I never saw fish camp until I went with my mom and dad for the commercial fish. Most natives leave their village and head out to the waters to stock up. Unlike her parents, Arlene never had that opportunity. She grew up in Anchorage. Nowadays, though, Anchorage is just her home base. Every summer, Arlene heads up to fish camp at Non Dalton. Here in Non Dalton, they put up their fish, they cut it, split it, and let it hang and dry and smoke it. Now, if you're one of those people that can't get out to fish camp, let someone else do it for you and buy it from George's Market. George's Market is the only store in Anchorage that sells native food. We open because I'm the only one that knows enough about native food. Spiro George opened George's Market in 1961. He never planned on specializing in native foods, but since that time, he's become quite a connoisseur. Seal oil, you could tell by looks of it, you could tell by smell of it. If it's too strong, it's a little bit rancid. But uh, I used to make it. I'd buy the blubber, and I make the seal oil, and I know how good it was, and that's why I said I could tell more about native food than I could tell about grocery. <laughs> I'm looking forward to more video from Fish Camp from different areas of the state. Let's travel now to Barrel and visit with Elise Pactacock. I recently spent an evening with three little friends that contained no social or nutritional value at all. It was a complete junk junket and we all had a blast. We started off at one of our local eateries having chips and cold sauce. 
Cold sauce, for those of you who are not gourmets, is the opposite of hot sauce. It's served in any restaurant that wants the repeat business of the under 10 club. After we pigged out on chips and sauce, we had two-toned pizza, half with pineapple and half with sausage for the purest in the crowd. We washed this all down with soda that had, gasp horrors, real sugar in it. So far, the perfect meal. But no meal is truly complete without a pure shot of sugar for dessert. So we headed out to our local store. Before purchasing dessert, we went to the toy section where we spent the better part of an hour ooing and eyeing over the latest in Barbie and Ken fashions while playing a game of one-upsmanship called, I have this one. The way the game is played is this. You walk down the aisle with just about any type of toy on it and try to get to the next item before your friend does. If you get there first, you can point to it and say, I've got this. Once you've claimed it for your own, the other players get no credit, even if they really do have one at home. Appeals to the judge on disputed items usually end in a tie since the judge is totally uninterested in handling any kind of hissy fit over the decision. Finally, we headed for dessert. To no one's surprise, the desserts chosen were pure sugar with something added to harden and color the basic ingredient. From the store, we headed to my house to complete the evening with a diet of cartoons, but not politically correct cartoons. No Care Bears or other touchy-feely pseudo-cartoon commercials. No, we went for the hardcore stuff, the stuff that supposedly warped the minds of my generation, Wiley Coyote, Daffy Ducks, Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig. Life can't always be as perfect as it was for us on that one evening. A steady diet of junk food and junk TV will probably rot the mind and create pudgy little bodies with blackened teeth. On the other hand, sometimes you just need to have an evening where you don't worry about anything. Kids can do that better than anyone I know, which is why they'll always be my favorite companions for a night of wild and reckless abandon. Once again, I'd like to welcome our Juno viewers. They watch us over KJUD-TV Channel 8. It's nice to have you with us. Also, a special hello to the inmates at the Palmer Correctional Center. The Native Culture Club sent me a very nice letter. In fact, hello to inmates throughout the North. We will not forget our incarcerated brothers and sisters, and we appreciate you watching the show. This 4th of July, please handle fireworks with care. Across the nation, there are over 10,000 accidents every year, many from the little tiny sparklers that children play with. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green. Join me next week, won't you, for Native News Across the North.